welcome to Cayman, the monthly live stream where your misery is always my focus. Weldon came out of a sketch I had done some time ago. I think it was on a napkin, one of those kind of things. He pitched me the idea of having an internet troll character, something that really was oh, made for the oh, internet. Are we back? I had this idea of building something with long skinny arms and big oversized hands. We felt like we wanted to start making something now. Claws and teeth and fur and horns. When we first started, we were packing up my car. I didn't know what it was yet. It became welded. To go to Kentucky. This is the Louisville Supercon, it looks like hell. To go oh, do the live show in Kentucky rather than a live show here. Still looks like hell. We started out shooting welded against green screen live, which presented all sorts of issues. So much chaos around these first few episodes. Every time we broadcast, we'd have problems. The internet sucks! Part of the appeal of doing a show like Cave In at this point is to get back to something I was doing pretty much 40 years ago. At the time we started Cave In, I was looking primarily for something to do locally in my hometown in Atlanta that would allow me to continue to grow as a performer and in other areas. And Cave In really became the way to do that. It also became a great way for me to learn a lot about the industry that I had formerly had all these other incredibly talented people to take care of. I almost think of it less as a passion project, though it is, but more as uh, continued education for me. Terminus Conference is a conference that ran a few years here in Atlanta uh, that was focused on innovation and the up and coming of Atlanta film. So I went to this uh, Atlanta event called Terminus, uh, which is a gathering of people, uh, professionals in the industry that mostly seem to be talking to up and coming young people in the industry. Steve and I met while standing in line for a lecture. This vo voice introduced himself, and I turned around, and I'm looking into his chest. And I just happened to, you know, strike up a conversation. And Liam is quite tall, uh, over seven feet. And so, uh, you know, I'm talking like this to Liam. I had mentioned that I was looking to get involved in more independent film projects in Atlanta. At the time, he had quite a conservative look. He was still in high school. Um, and I, I presumed he was much older than he was. I figured he was pretty close to 30, probably. Turns out he was 17. And he said to me, well, you know, if you ever want to um, maybe think about putting together a pilot for something or something like that, you know, let me know. I could help you pull that together. I've got some equipment. And uh, I said, okay. So we, you know, we sat with each other in this talk and then we kind of went our separate ways. I don't think we saw each other for the rest of the conference. Um, but I had this address, you know, I had this, uh, this email address. A few months later, I got an email back and we kind of set off from there. I thought, well, there was this young guy who, you know, he's, 28, and uh, I'll get in touch with him. He, he said he had the equipment. He said he wants to do this stuff. Hey, he seemed like a nice guy. Let's let's see what we can do. Steve and I both, from our first meeting, kind of saw that the other one was just trying to create something, you know, great and, and hear the other one's perspective. At the time, I had about five projects that I was interested in pursuing from super hard, huge, big project to a fairly simple thing and everything in between. And... I don't think either one of us knew where that was going to go exactly. You know, we just started thinking about the idea of trying to collaborate on something. We each brought something to the table that was unique. Steve brought the years of industry experience and the, uh, you know, the talent, of, talent of puppeteering and the character creation and all the, the creative backing. And then I brought this kind of new way of creating things that is, you know, how I've lived my life uh, here in Atlanta and created my career growing up is like the scrappy kind of make what you can with what you have attitude. I needed someone who was at a point where they knew what they were doing and they had a sense of what they wanted to do um, that would do this, um, first of all, out of the goodness of their heart because I had no budget. Second of all, um, sort of looking at it as, in a funny sort of way, kind of, I don't know, an internship in a way because I, I wanted Liam to start out helping me and, and I could sort of help him learn the, the sides of this that... I do and what's required to get through the puppetry and, and the way we shoot this stuff. And um, I felt like it would be a learning experience for him at the same time as he's getting on his feet as a, as a producer and a filmmaker. Uh, and I think that's the way it's probably turned out. Here we are again, all of us right here together separately. <laughs> I am Weldon the IT guy, a troll in chief, and you are watching Cave In, the monthly live stream where your misery is always my focus. And when I say focus, I don't just mean focus, because I rarely say what I mean, and I rarely mean what I say.
I mean, your misery is my life's purpose. I came up with this ridiculous idea back in the first shows um, of having the date match the time. In other words, our first show was August 31st at 8.31 p.m. So 8.31 on 8.31. It, it was a mess. It was an interesting idea for a troll to do this. But by the end of this, we did our last show at about 2 in the morning, I think. It was crazy. So we, I said, okay, enough of that. We're moving into a new year. We're just going to go at 10 p.m. on the last Friday of every month, unless it's Christmas. And I, I actually did that last year, too. Join me streaming live from my cave on December 25th from noon to midnight EST for my laid back and lazy holiday open cave 12 hours. There are certain elements to a live broadcast that are always chaotic and crazy. Uh, I mean, there's only so much you can do about the power blinking on you or a, a light falling down mid show or Weldon's oh, oh, eyebrow oh, popping oh, off. Oh, oh, my eye. Not saying that happened, but it might have. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, what buttons do I need to push? Oh, am I gonna get this transition right? Oh, let me make sure the internet's still, you know, healthy. I know Steve will say something different on his end because he's thinking about a whole separate list of things on that same day. And he's thinking about, you know, running a character and all, all that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, two different worlds that we're existing in, me behind this little desk and him in front of it, usually me waving my hands anytime I need to convey something to him. We, we still haven't come up with any sort of like sign language code, but I feel like we need to in the near future. We've gotten to the point where we're able to respond to these kind of things a lot more quickly and a lot with a lot less panic. Uh, and so I think that really shows me how much we've grown. You get like cramps in your, in your thighs, like leg cramps, like, like in your thighs? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's fascinating. Okay, tell me more, because it ain't that oh. fascinating. Our live stream nights are uh, very different than our production days. Uh, Liam and I will usually try to set up the day before um, as a function, in my case, of just having a more stress-free time prior to the <laughs> live show. I'm really trying to focus on character at that point. Uh, Weldon's about to go on and have to talk. And I never know what he's gonna say past his opening little monologue that we usually, I usually make notes on. Uh, so I try to be rested and ready for that. We always have last minute checks on our internet service to make sure we actually have some. We initially started out with Liam trying to screen calls and run the show uh, and deal with any problems that we were having, and it was nuts. So we check in with uh, my brother-in-law, Ron Gaynor, who is Captain Ron. Uh, Captain Ron is our remote call screener, uh, and, and thank goodness for him, it's a huge job. One of the first challenges when Liam and I decided to work together was, where do we do this stuff? To do a monthly live stream, we needed a base of operation that was at least our own little space. Didn't have to be elaborate, just needed to be functional. Liam had access to a space that we hadn't really considered as an option for a studio per se. The one thing it had in it was a built-in sort of curb psych. But it was gonna require a lot of um, finagling and, and restructuring and building and thinking about it in order to make it work. It was both Liam and I up and down ladders with hammers and nails and uh, really doing real construction to turn this space into really a functioning, I would call it an insert stage. It's not massive, but it's big enough to shoot what we're shooting with a stationary character, which is primarily what we do no matter what we're shooting with Weldon. Um, it still took a lot of work though. So very much, you know, I've got a barn kind of thing. You know, we've got our place now. By sheer willingness to go out and be involved in projects and do what I need to do, do whatever needs to be done. I've been able to meet so many talented people who've helped establish New Haven Productions. That's a lot of the value I think we provide is these amazing people who've been willing to come together and collaborate with us on these projects. Our mid-show numbers that we've done with Weldon have just been all over the map. Um, I usually try to make them at least a minute long. Some of them have been 10 minutes. It depends on what we're doing. We've done some narrative stories that go on and on and on. Is Weldon. Hi, Weldon. Jeez, I'm a troll, not an alcoholic. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joe Psychotic, and this here is Orcas to say hello, you sexy beast. Ooh. And there's ponchos in the gift shop to say I got feet on by an ogre. I'll hold the ball, and you come running and kick it. Oh, for crying out loud, floozy. Do you think I'm stupid? Yes, but that's besides the point. Our production days, usually we will generally start mid-morning and we go until it's done, as long as it takes. Hopefully we finish by six or seven. We try to get it done in a day, sometimes it takes two days, uh, but that's the nature of production, you know? If you get, when you get this thing done, then you go to the next stage of it. <laughs>
We've done a number of sketches that included appearances by celebrity guest stars. Tim Bendig, who heads up in-person productions, has been uh, instrumental in supporting Cave In. Uh, amongst other things, he's acted as a liaison between the show and celebrity talent. What did she say? Who cares what she said? She clearly chose me. Huh? That's not how this works. Yeah, you can't get rid of us that easy, yo. Don't be too sure, moron. You guys are just mad at it. Hang on. When we get into the studio to shoot these mid-show production numbers, I have already spent sometimes three or four weeks getting it together. Um, and I wear all these different hats in the process. Holy setup! We suffered through a whole page of dialogue to get to that stupid joke? The concepts for everything we do on Cave In just come from all sorts of places. No, yo, we need stronger thongs. What did you just say? I said, we need... Something that's happening in the world, a couple of words or a sentence. It plays a song or he sings or he does this musical number. There's usually a spark of an idea that just just starts to grow like crazy. I will usually take a concept, do an initial outline on it at least, sometimes do an initial script, and I will send that to Jim Lewis, and sometimes we'll go back and forth with many, many drafts. Jim will add icing on top of that cake, and then that's what we go with. I've worked with Jim for at least 30 years. He understands what puppets can do and what puppets can't do easily. He's got a great edgy sense of humor, edgier than, than the work we do with the Muppets. I'll always run the ideas by Liam, by Melissa, um, by anybody who walks in the room. The ideas come from everywhere, um, not just from me. Weldon's playing all the roles, so all of the um, joy and burden of performance falls on me. What's your name, man? Alexander Hamilton. You must be kidding. No, it's Alexander Hamilton. How does a bastard, orphan, son of a whore have a Broadway smash with such a catchy score? That can be <laughs> difficult oh, you when you're also directing and you're trying to keep your head in the script. You should see the new phone Steve Jobs is working on now. And you're trying to edit as you shoot and you think about how it's all going to go together because you're going to cut it together too. Are you going to score it? Are you gonna, what are you going to do with the music? It's all in there at the same time. So I have to really rely on um, a little bit of autopilot when it comes to the performance sometimes. Uh, thank goodness that, that I know how to make the puppet work. But I really try to just stop and take a deep breath and focus on the performance as Liam is slating to take. Uh, otherwise, I'm in big trouble. If you look at our sketches too, I mean, just the difference between the, the first one, the Dark Crystal parody that we did, and I mean, Star Trek Wars is going to look like someone else entirely made it. Good point. Oh, I'll get the hot glue gun. Steve and I working together on this, it's very satisfying as a, as a creator of something. Yes! What? All these selfies? I thought I was the only one! It makes me feel like, oh, like, I'm actively getting better at making this show better. And that's how you know that a project's worth working on is when it continues to grow over time and it doesn't just stop in a certain place. Star Trek Wars is yo yo, scene 6A, take 3. So with our trusty final draft of the script in hand and building all the puppets and costumes behind me, it's time for the three of us to go into the studio and roll camera. Now, normally Weldon plays all the roles in these sketches, but in this case, there were a few new puppets to build. In the case of a project as complex as Star Truck Wars, I pre-recorded most of the scenes for timing, so we're all working to audio playback on the floor. This time, try making the words your own. Even though we have our script, we always try to add little nuances and moments as we go. Our shooting days are, are silly and fun and, and even intense sometimes. And uh, for me, it involves a considerable amount of coffee. Did someone call me? <laughs> I'm Isaac Gasmarain. I'm the chief art director for New Haven Productions, which more recently has involved me getting into graphics and doing 3D animations. 
um, which has made me really excited to bring to life our latest project, uh, Star Trek Wars. There was a local film festival in Atlanta, a Terminus. I was volunteering there. Well, he got a free badge in, in exchange for helping out around the conference. Well, I don't think I was supposed to technically be like, you know, socializing as much as a volunteer. I'm not sure he was the best volunteer by the end of that one because uh, I, I ended up pulling him over and we just sat and chatted on the floor for about the entire weekend. But we just really hit it off and started talking. We got so fascinated with each other's views on film and I could tell that he was very passionate. Funnily enough, at that same exact film festival, I ran into Steve Whitmire. It's funny to look back on like that singular day working at that film festival. Um, the th me meeting both of both Steve and Liam was like has now turned into like me working with them. To start sharing Weldon's world with the audience necessitates coming up with ways to put him into his world as I see it in my head. Trying to find more complex ways of using this one puppet in ways that hopefully keep it entertaining when he's talking to himself as different characters uh, has been really quite a journey and very complicated. Ah, what a Mickey Mouse operation. We do everything via green screen with him. And while we can create certain level of backgrounds and, and Steve loves to do his in, uh, word, word processors, I think. Um, there's there's definitely limitations on what can be there, and you know bringing in Isaac helps us really build a world of his own for Weldon. I started out creating all of the backgrounds in Weldon's world in Pages, which is an Apple word processor. It's just about the last app you would ever choose to build backgrounds. But you know you work with what you've got, and it's a real lesson in it's not about the technology as much as it's about what you choose to try to do with it. So to move on to do something like this Star Truck Wars piece that we're doing, it's certainly the most complicated thing we've tried to do and the biggest endeavor so far. And to be able to bring someone like Isaac in, who's very enthusiastically in the process of still learning about uh, 3D technology, I think it was something he could sink his teeth into. When Liam brought me onto the project, it really gave me the opportunity to take all of this 3D knowledge that I had built up and condense it into one much larger project than anything I'd worked on before. And also allowing me to expand on my own creative skills as well, because going through from the very start of concepting to modeling through iterations of different models to animation is allowing me to be a better 3D artist, be a better communicator and develop new skills. When we decided to do Star Trek Wars, we had a lot of limitations in terms of what we would be able to actually see as a finished product. And so Dell graciously loaned us a couple of their precision workstations. A huge help was having very fast computer power. One of the unique challenges with working with 3D software is how much time it can take to even see what you've created. The Dell laptop drastically increased how fast we've been able to render out different frames. I actually did a test where I set up my old Mac and I set up the Dell laptop and I rendered the same exact scene. Say it takes you know 10 seconds to render it on the Dell versus 20 seconds for the Mac. It's great, you know, I saved myself 10 seconds. In terms of thinking about that as an animation, you know, when you're rendering out a three in a minute long animation, that's thousands and thousands of frames, which ends up being hours upon hours that you can save just by knocking off a few of those seconds. So learning 3D has made me think about how important it is to have that good hardware and just how much every single second counts, especially when you're doing animation and especially for a longer form project like this. Everybody who downloads Blender deletes it at least once before they actually learn it. Working with a 3D interface, there's just so much more information than you're ever used to. One of the things that I didn't think about as a limitation, specifically with Blender, is how many keyboard shortcuts there are. Blender is actually built in with all of these different functionalities to all of the buttons pre-made by the professionals. So being able to use the Dell laptop for this project by having that extra number pad on the side, it's just been a great help. It certainly sped up the time uh, that it would have taken Isaac to get this stuff done. He had both laptops working at the same time rendering uh, and was able to really get through this in a timely way. Isaac and I worked very closely together on trying to see what was in my head come out through him into these 3D models and worlds that he was creating. The shots and the angles and that sort of thing. To convey that to another individual can be really tough. It starts with Steve and I emailing Steve is able to send over some really great concept pieces and we talk about it for a little bit discussing you know what details might work better for 3D what might not going back and forth on you know different versions of each of the models I'll actually go in and I'll start building the 3D models themselves and figuring out 
what parts of these 2D images are going to work in 3D. And trying to find that balance has been really interesting. We are not trying to go hyper-realistic, but we're trying to not completely simplify things to the point where it looks like a, a child's cartoon. Steve has a very uh, artistic and creative-centered mind and focus with everything that he does. He knows what he's looking for in his pieces, and he can imagine it in his mind, and he can articulate that. And so it's been a dialogue between us of figuring out what is realistic that we can do. If you just took the tire off. Oh. And you, you could be super close up. Like you're beyond the, the tires and wheels. To identify the detail here, and then we sort of pull back as we start around it, and we see that there's tires, and we see that there's a cockpit. Oh, I see. Here, so this is the render view. I already scaled it down a little bit. Uh-huh. Um, the cockpit. I don't know what you're thinking. I haven't made this mesh very well yet. And you can ignore the background. It's just wow. lighting. But that looks amazing. I love it. In terms of the scaling, you do want it this size. You're thinking? I, I think so. This... Yeah, uh, the the uh, cockpit. Yeah. yeah, I think it, I think that's a good overall size. Star Trek is jerk. Scene one B, take one. Working with Steve over the last few years has really helped me learn a lot about working with people who are a lot more experienced in the industry than I am. He's very patient and very understanding, and I think it's a good way to kind of segue into what it's like to work at these high levels. Come on, space and traffic! Okay, that was not terrible. Steve's used to working with the top of the top at the Muppets, and so being able to work one-on-one -on -one with him and have him treat me the same as he would treat a producer on one of those shows holds me to a standard where I feel like I need to continuously, you know, work to reach that. If there's one thing I've learned over the years, it's that it's very important to find the right group of people to work with when you're trying to collaborate on anything artistic. Um, you can have your own visions, but if you find the right people to help you make those visions come into reality, then you can really come up with something truly wonderful. And both Liam and Isaac have turned out to be those people, along with the rest of the cave -in team. Um, you know, I was 19 years old when Jim Henson pulled me into his team, and um, that's the same general stage of life where Liam and Isaac are now. So I kind of know firsthand how beneficial it can be when you're forming your own styles to be mentored in the perspectives of someone who's been around a little bit. But at the same time, it's invaluably beneficial to me to have access to the perspectives of these young, passionate minds who are newer to this and see them grow as we all grow together. Um, Jim Henson once said that he didn't really know where the ideas come from, but I can tell you uh, that if you find the right people to collaborate with, well, that definitely has something to do with it. Thank you all very much. Hello? Hey there, Weldon. Yeah, kidding me. If you'd like to see Star Trek Wars or any of the other crazy stuff we've done on Cave In, you can jump over to the Cave In YouTube channel, and you can also go there and search Weldon the IT Guy. Hope you enjoy. Will you please stop calling me?